Yeah, you know, I came away from Israel just feeling confused by my experience. And I think the reason why I felt so confused was I, I felt like there was this uneasy truce between all of these pagan religions and what amounts to a very volatile mixture. And it's volatile politically, it's volatile religiously, and it's volatile spiritually. And I saw us inspired up to gentlemen, we welcome you to another episode of the podcast, for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. Today, Jeff and I are going to discuss the mixture of paganism that not only remains in what calls itself the church, but is in Israel to this day. Jeff was with us on our live stream, which discussed witchcraft that we did on Halloween. And now he's going to join us again tonight to discuss the paganism that he saw in his recent trip to Israel. But before we begin, let's pray. Father God, I just praise you and thank you for being in tonight's podcast. In the name of Jesus, we bind up and rebuke any demonic spirits that would interfere with Jeff or myself, and we command them to leave both of us in Jesus' mighty name. We also come against any demonic spirits that would interfere the listener and cause them to receive anything that's not of God. We bind that up and command those demons to leave all listeners right now in Jesus' mighty name. Father God, we thank you that no flesh would speak, and we thank you for using this podcast tonight to communicate to your people your holiness and your desire for us to serve you without mixture. We give you all the praise and glory for this. In Jesus' my name, we pray. Amen. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us what you saw on your trip to Israel last week. It's a pleasure. Great to be on it again, Doug. Oh, man. I'm just glad to have you. You know, you you were calling me and Skyping me from Israel and sending photos and just telling me all the things you saw. And I just couldn't help to be reminded during the winter solstice season when we were discussing the paganism in the church through the winter solstice and Sol Invicta and Saturnalia activities that still go on among Christians. And you were also sending me photos of satanic, ancient, Babylonian, pre-Christ satanic symbolism that was still in Israel to this day too. So I kept considering not only the mixture in the church, but the mixture that remains in Israel. And I thought of some of the same scriptures that we were addressing uh, in our Christmas live stream, and this is one of them from Deuteronomy 12.1. It says, These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree, and you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire, and you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. And then if you go to the end of that same chapter, 12 of Deuteronomy, the Lord goes on to say through Moses, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise." Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods, for even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods, burnt their sons and daughters alive. He says, What things, whoever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto nor diminish from it. So God made clear to Israel from the beginning that all the works of the pagans that they were going to uh, destroy at the behest of the Father because of their sin, because of their idolatry, because of their Satanism, because of their murders and of their sacrifices of children and, and, and adults to their gods through the fire, he was going to destroy them. He said, don't do after them. And yet in the Christian church, through all of our paganism, whether it's Christmas or Ishtar, I mean Easter, which is the, uh, the celebration of Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. That's why you got the bunny rabbits and the, the Easter eggs. And all of these things, they stem from paganism and the mixtures there. And the mixture also still remains in Israel as a whole. 
And Jeff, I kind of saw from what you were saying to me, three categories of it. There was the mixture of the Catholic idolatries and the Catholic um, churches and, and Orthodox churches remaining there with all of their idolatries. And then, of course, you've got Freemasonry's presence there. And then you have um, just the, the, the mixing of ancient pagan symbolism and, and some of their commercial ventures. And I wanted to address it from those three levels, starting with the, the Catholicism there. What did, what did you see and, and what can you tell us about it? You might call me a bit of a spiritual tourist as I was uh, making my way through these sites in Israel where a lot of events that are holy and sacred to us had actually physically occurred. And what really struck me was how these sites uh, had been commandeered by, by the Catholic Church and by the Orthodox Church. And it looked like really any other Catholic church that you'd see anywhere in a major European or American city. And I was really struck by the presence of just mass presence of tourists that were going into these sites. It was sort of like a Disney, Disney-fied version of going through the Holy Land. A lot of commercialization, big buses, busfuls of tourists and tour guides um, and people were paying you know, pretty penny to, to, to spend some time on these sites, but there's nothing really extraordinary about them other than that they had a lot of very expensive and very fancy architecture. And in that architecture, you're seeing very clearly that ancient Babylonian and pagan symbols had been absorbed by the Catholic Church and put right there on top of these sites in cities like Bethlehem and Nazareth and Jericho. So that was uh, very striking for me immediately as I as I got there. So what were some of the specific examples of that? Were you seeing like statues of Mary and Joseph and and uh, or Mary and and the baby Jesus in her, in her arms and things that we would typically see in an American church? Yeah, there were a few. So one that stood out quite a bit for me was Mary and Jesus imagery in the Church of the Annunciation, specifically in Nazareth, which is a church that I think was erected in 1969 um, to commemorate the actual site where they believed that the angel Gabriel had visit, visited Mary to let her know that she would be carrying out the virgin birth. And in that church, there were uh, icon representations of Mary and Jesus, the one that we that we typically think of when we think of the Catholic Church. Um, and there, there had been contributions from hundreds of countries on their own variation of what they believed their Mary and Jesus looked like. And every single one looked to me like some some um, sort of Tammuz, Semiramis representation mm. uh, that, you know, that that we that we see um, that, that that looks like the sort of like the Catholic bastardization of the the semi-ramus imagery. Mm. And I just thought that was a uh, really unusual um, and unnecessary homage to, to Mary and Jesus. But um, seeing that, that it was, you know, that it was a product of the Catholic church, it w wasn't really that surprising for me. What was surprising was that that was one of the main sites for somebody to go visit in, in Nazareth. Mm. Mm -hmm. So when you think you're going to, get closer to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, you're actually getting closer to paganism through these Catholic and Orthodox churches. Exactly. That, that, the, the, the imagery is so striking, right? Right when you get off the bus, these are the first things you see. So what about on the, on the, it looks like on the outside veneer of the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth, you have this pagan sun worship with the five-pointed star on top, and it looks like a a uh, star inside of some kind of uh, stained glass with more imagery on it. That's, that's indicative of pagan sun worship. Yeah. So if you look closely, you'll see inside that sun in the circle, what looks like Mary and Jesus and Joseph, but mm. for whatever reason, it's encapsulated in a sun. Mm. And if you just think, beyond the representation of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, is it necessary to place that inside a sun? And we know that the sun and the sun god Ra was extremely important in Egyptian Babylonian religion. Um, and it just seems like, an, like a merger of the two. 
So I've noticed that the depiction of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus is nested inside a 12-pointed star. And here's just a little information that I dug up on Babylonian symbolism. So the 12-pointed star uh, is typically used in, in the Kabbalah. And you'll also find uh, the 12-pointed star appears on the United Nations-related Lucis Trust website. Lucis standing uh, for Lucifer. Right, exactly. And, and Kabbalah, by the way, is Jew Jewish mysticism. It's basically Jew Jewish idolatry. So there are probably multiple meanings for that 12-pointed uh, star. And it's not an accident, you know, that it's, not, it's very deliberate that, that that would be there. They never do anything without a purpose. That is the absolute truth. So you can see there's so many layers to artwork like this. If you zoom in on it, you can see that the sun rays begin as little pyramid shapes. And inside of them, there's some kind of almost clover leaf looking thing or flower leaf thing with an X and... You know, all of these things have meaning. They're not there for no reason. That's a double negative. They don't put them there without cause. And I, I, we could spend hours on each one of these things, but suffice to say that it's all related to paganism. And I noticed yeah. that if you go, we go to the next uh, photo, there's some Masonic imagery. Yeah, this, this really grabbed my eye when I was perusing through the church. Is there really a reason why you need to have the cross on top of a triangle, which looks like an Egyptian pyramid? It looks like it's a three-dimensional yeah. pyramid, is it not? Like, could you go around to the side and see a full pyramid there, or is it just a triangle, like a two-dimensional triangle? Oh, it's a full pyramid. It is a full yeah. pyramid. It stands to reason because Catholicism is the mixture. And then, of course, you go outside and you— we're pointing out this Babylonian ziggurat. Yeah. So when I saw this, I, I thought that it didn't look like other structures that I had seen in Israel, uh, spire like structures or towers. Um, this one was really a little different in that it, it looks a lot like the, uh, the silhouette in any case looks a lot like a Babylonian ziggurat, which is a, you know, the, the structure used, for Babylonian um, sacrifices and, and ritual ritual practices. Um, the Tower of Babel, most notably, is a um, kind of a ziggurat uh, structure. And I just immediately thought, is there a reason why they would need to have something like this on the Church of the Annunciation? Why couldn't it just be a square building? Why would this ziggurat structure have to be on top of it? Yeah, everything has its purpose yeah. in, in masonry and Freemasonry and Catholicism. All of their buildings, whether it's at the Vatican or there in Israel, it doesn't matter. They all have a purpose to mix in the old satanic uh, paganism from Egypt, from Babylon, and mix that in into uh, a form of Christianity that denies the power of God and the truth of God, which is throw down these temples, throw down these idols, get rid of them according to the scriptures that we read. And, you know, to your yep. earlier point, you were talking about uh, making merchandise of it. I mean, this is a huge, I'm sure, multi-billion dollar industry. This from Wikipedia, tourism in Israel is one of Israel's major sources of income, with a record 3.6 million tourist arrivals since 2017 and 25% growth since 2016, and contributed $20 billion to the Israeli economy, making it an all-time record. So this is no small amount of income for Israel. And it's getting back to the point about making merchandise of, of things, of spiritual things, you know, this has been a snare in Israel. And this is why in John chapter 2, we find this story about Jesus entering the temple during Passover, and he found those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And so Israel didn't have the zeal for it then. They don't have the zeal for it now because there's money at stake. And I'm, 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 <laughs> it sounds like I'm being completely racist and saying all Jews care about is money, but that's the case around the world in every culture that when money it can be made um, through tourism related to spiritual things, it's going to be made, you know, and it's the same way here in the States or even in India with the Taj Mahal and so on. 
people are going to go and see these religious sites and they're going to pay big money and spend big money while they're there. And this goes against God's will when it comes to idolatry, that he wants the pagan things out, whether it's out of the land of the ancient Hebrews and out of the land of Israel today, or out of uh, what calls itself the church today. We have to get the mixture out. And we certainly should not be making profit off of them. Yeah. And, you know, Doug, I felt like it was very similar to going to ancient castles in Western Europe, bus fulls of tourists taking photos, selfie sticks, posting on Instagram where they were standing. Um, and you just swap out some, say, 17th century castle in Scotland for the site of where Christ was supposedly born. The, the actual physical experience of standing there was like dodging tourists and, and selfie sticks. And I just thought that was really not what I expected. Of course, I had been a little bit uh, under-researched and under-prepared, and I should have anticipated the masses of tourists, but that's really what, what it was like. It was just a, like a Disney World for, for religion. Who's going to stop the tourists from going to the Holy Land in that sense? You know, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not even as upset about that as I am about the pagan symbolism, the pagan um, graven images that are there. When that was the land given to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the offspring, and this was a God of holiness and purity. And it's offensive to me that something comes in the name of Christ in, uh, with paganism attached to it. So that's the phony aspect of it there that, that really bothers me. But I wouldn't mind going there, and I guess at some point I would take a picture and and do all those things. But the fact that it's coupled with and attached to pagan idolatry makes it far worse to me. Yeah, and I think that's what the draw was for a lot of the tourists, was was to be able to see all these beautiful structures. Certainly it adds to the the mythical element of the experience for for them, and and they they know what they're doing. They, They set up all these really an ornate um, edifices so that people can feel like they're getting the full theme park experience. Right. You know, you mentioned Western Europe. I remember going through, we, we went on this tour that basically started in Munich and it went around through Austria and parts of Switzerland and a little bit of France and then back into Germany again. And like everywhere we went, we just went into church after church after church. And I'd been even raised Catholic. And at that point I was just kind of an unbeliever. I wasn't even uh, saved or born again yet, but I felt something somewhat creepy about it without really knowing why, you know, now I I could understand why I would be creeped out about it. But when you see the layer upon layer upon layer of just Egyptian and Babylonian pagan symbolism that is throughout every Catholic edifice or Orthodox edifice you enter, you, you almost like wonder, what happened to the Christianity that could have was there? It's not. It's just a. Yeah. It's just a splattering of of some Christianity mixed in with paganism. That's all it is. There is definitely a dark feeling I, I had in walking around in quite a few of these places where I was like, "All right, I've seen enough. Like, time, time for me to leave." I almost would have told you not to go if you weren't getting all these pictures. You know, I mean, it's very <laughs> helpful for the people to be able to see. You're almost like going in undercover for us and. I appreciate you doing that. <laughs> so now let's kind of oh like God. shift gears to the presence of Freemasonry right there in your face in Tel Aviv. Tell us what you saw. So I was walking around in old Jaffa. Jaffa is an, is an ancient port city right on the Mediterranean, which uh, predated the existence of Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv, this large huge metropolis now just absorbed it in into um into the city so it's all the way down in the southwestern part of tel aviv on the mediterranean coastline and as you walk around all these cobblestone streets you'll see orthodox churches and you'll see sort of like the kind of mercantile history uh because it served as a major trading port but then i stumbled across this structure here because it wasn't very big relative to the to all the other buildings there but it was, it's clearly a Masonic, uh, some sort of Masonic rite um, site of worship or, or site, site of rituals. And you'll see here that it's the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis Mizraim. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Memphis Mizraim. 
Just to tell you a little bit about what I was able to find, find out about this site. The rite of Mizraim from as early as 1738, one can find traces of this rite filled with alchemical, occult, and Egyptian references with a structure of 90 degrees. For the rite of Memphis, you can read here from Wikipedia, the rite of Memphis was constituted by Jacques Etienne Marconi de Negre, sorry, I'm totally butchering the name, in 1838 as a variant of the rite of Misraim, combining elements from Templarism and chivalry with Egyptian and alchemical mythology. So very clearly we're seeing uh, some open Freemasonic free practices right there um, in Tel Aviv uh, on the Mediterranean. And look at the signage. I mean, the one on the right with the square and compass literally has the Egyptian eye of Horus in the middle of it. And they squared off the square and the compass with uh, a straight line that makes it look like this, the star of, of David, which is really the star of Remphan. It's more like the ancient star of Remphan. David didn't carry a star in his banners. Um, so, excuse me, the star of David is, is not authentically his star. And then if you look at the sign there on the left with the ancient primitive rite of Memphis and Israel, and you see it's got one of those serpent uh, circles around it where the snake eats the end of eats its tail. Mm. So the circle that goes around it is called the Uroboros, which is an ancient symbol depicting a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. It originates in ancient Egyptian icono- iconography. So, and it has also ties to Greek magical tradition. So this right here is the serpent represents Satan in the Bible. So it tells you right off the bat that there's something wrong. Then inside of that at the top, there's a pyramid shape with sun rays coming out of it with a little dot in the middle that represents the all-seeing eye. And you just, you just look throughout this thing and everything you see has a ancient pagan representation. There's also the moon on the left of it, the sun on the right. And there's five pointed stars that are not all pointing straight up. They like to they like to turn the star a little bit so it can be the downward pointing uh, five pointed star of the Baphomet. So it's just right there in the middle of this ancient land that God told the Hebrews to get this mess out. And you know, as you alluded to in our call earlier, this all began back when Moses was on the mount getting the Ten Commandments, and he came down and found that Israel had already built or made a golden calf to worship. And then, of course, they destroyed that. And when Joshua finally takes the people into Israel to clear the land of these pagans, they didn't clear them all. And it it yet remained, and the mixture remained. And it's been there from the beginning, and it's been a thorn in the side of Israel ever since. Because they didn't clear it out, and it's a thorn in the church that we still have paganism running amok in the church through Ishtar and Easter and Christmas, and all of the paganism that's in the church through the church at Rome, which became Catholicism. They, they're mirror images of each other, aren't they? So now let's shift gears to the secular world and some of the things that you saw that was mixed into some of the advertising, the signage, and um, the branding of different uh, brands that tied right back to ancient Sodom and Gomorrah, to ancient um, Babylon and Babel. What were some of the things you saw? Right there around the corner from that Masonic site, there is this beauty, uh, I guess, a beauty shop that, you know, they're uh, they're selling Dead Sea uh, beauty products. The name of the shop is called the the Apple of Sodom. Wow. Uh, So I did a little bit of digging. Yeah, and I looked up the Apple of Sodom, um, a couple of things I could refer to is there's a species of milkweed which is native to the Dead Sea, which is called the Apple of Sodom. I don't know if they actually use that milkweed as a uh, as an input into beauty products. There's also a song by Marilyn Manson, um, so we could read that for what it is. But I just thought it was striking that they're taking the Apple reference and, of course, Sodom, and they're branding their products around the, the, you know, the forbidden apple, and then also the biblical city of Sodom. So, so clearly, there's there's some, you know, some reconciliation with those two um, ignominious symbols from from the Bible uh, for branding and merchandising. 
so ironic like sodom was completely destroyed and people say it was it was down around by the dead sea somewhere in that area the cities of the plain and you know of course sodom and gomorrah and there were 10 cities that were destroyed by the fire and brimstone but to think that for me if i lived in israel and i read my old testament torah and i had learned that an entire land part of it called sodom was destroyed by god I would not name anything after it. I would not give any glory to Sodom, which is the root word of sodomy, which is anal intercourse. So it's just t- today is like every barrier is gone down between outright filth and and just normal day to day living. It's Miley Cyrus twerking in front of that guy on the stage. It's. Just this dirty, just filthy, see, nasty world we live in with no barriers. To it just seems like, that. yeah, and it, on that point, it just seems like an appropriation of things that were historically considered taboo or, you know, forbidden. And then it's taking both of them and then putting them together and trying to brand it as cool and something desirable. That's just crazy. Didn't you find some other commercial represent? Yeah, so... I did pass by a large mall uh, in Tiberias on the way uh, to the Sea of Galilee, Tiberias being an ancient Babylonian city, which is the historic origin of the Kabbalah. But there is a, a, a large, I guess, a shoe chain in Israel called Nimrod oh from goodness. Genesis. Yeah. We talked so, so much about Nimrod last week with regard to the winter solstice celebrations. It said that he died and was reincarnated as a fir tree. Um, he's the root of, of a lot of, of pagan satanic symbolism. Many people think that many demonic entities, uh, that came about such as Saturn and so on, that they were, they were really just Nimrod in in another form. So it's just, should we be surprised? We shouldn't. Cause if you look at, at Gucci or any of these other, you know, modern high level brands, they all have a mixture of paganism with their symbolism into their advertising it's, it shouldn't be surprising there's a snake imagery for gucci best for pisces for, uh, for chanel and we could just go on and on about that and other channels have done a better job than i have the time to do it's just so obvious it should be obvious to everyone what's going on i just really am so glad that you came on tonight so that we can just talk about it from the perspective of israel and the church just mirror imaging one another when it comes to these things that we are, we're just both so filled up with paganism and compromise to demons and to Satan. And a lot of it has to do with staying wealthy and selfishness and getting what's ours and making sure we're taken care of. We're trusting in mammon and money and compromising yep. for the mammon and the money because we don't trust God. That's the problem. Israel doesn't trust God, and we don't trust God. And we serve the same, we're supposed to be serving the same God, but we have completely replaced God's word with, as far as the Jews go, is with the Talmud and their other writings, the rabbinical writings, and Christians have replaced it with Catholic catechisms and books of Mormon and writings of the Jehovah's Jehovah's Witnesses and all of these writings that have superseded God's word. That's what we've done. And we have become the mixture as a people. And we, Jews and Gentiles alike, we better get it right. Because judgment begins with the house of God. And there's about to be a big time tribulation on this earth that's going to start. People think it's bad now. It's going to get way worse. And it's going to start with us. It's going to start with us. We have got to start checking ourselves and getting the mixture out. And to this point, I want to say, I was watching the video everyone suggested about Christmas, and I'll put a link in the description box. And they did a really good job uh, showing the pagan roots of Christmas. And at the end of it, they're talking about how people say that celebrating Christmas isn't a sin, so why stop doing it? And I think that if I heard it right, I think that's where the video went wrong. It is a sin. This is a sin. It is a sin to incorporate a mixture of pagan worship practices in with 
serving our holy God. Our God is not the counterfeiter. He doesn't take Satan's things and put his name on it. He's too pure and too holy for that. Satan's the counterfeiter. So I am saying to everybody that listens to this, that to go through your home and get every single idol out of your home, every single little graven image of an angel, every little single graven image of, of Jesus or of a cross or whatever, you need to get the graven images out and worship God in spirit and in truth and stop using things that you can see to supposedly remind you of serving God. The job of the Holy Spirit is to bring everything to your remembrance that Jesus has told you, not seeing some something around your neck hanging there, not having something, a ring or uh, with a cross on it or something around your wrist to remind you. If you're walking with the Holy Spirit, he's going to remind you of everything you need to know. And we need to get these mixtures out of our homes and we need to stop going to these temples of idolatry and come out of her, my people, and not be a partaker of her sins. And it is paramount that we do this. These pagan temples that call themselves churches and synagogues that are scattered throughout the landscapes of every nation, we need to come out and be separate and be holy because God has had enough of this and judgment's coming upon this. So I'm just feeling like I'm making a clarion call right now after hearing Jeff's testimony about what he saw and you know, I drive in the Southeast a lot. I see all these pagan temples that call themselves churches with their um, steeples on top, which are erect phalluses to, to the heavens. It's basically an obelisk, which is an erect penis on top of our churches. We need to come out and be holy as God is holy. And don't even visit them anymore. You know, there's a scripture that says, don't even speak the name of these other gods. So don't even visit these churches anymore with these idols in them and iconog iconography and the, and the stained glass and all of that. Stop going into their pagan ritual temples and start worshiping God in spirit and truth and reading his word and getting it down in you and learning to keep Jesus's commandments. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments and focus on your relationship with him and being obedient to his word and learning the word so you know what to be obedient to and come out of this ignorance that comes from not knowing the word of God and leads you to go to a church or a temple where there is absolute, sa absolute satanic idolatry going on because God can no longer wink his eye at this. He's not going to wink his eye at it anymore. It says in um, revelation that no idolater shall enter into the new heaven and the new earth. And if you want to be a part of it, you need to get clean. It's time to get clean. So, I'm going to go ahead and conclude with prayer. Father God, I just praise you and thank you. I feel like tonight's message is so needed in the church. We are just like people that don't know our left hand from our right. Sometimes I just feel like we don't even have any idea what hurts you, Lord. We don't, we don't even know because we don't know your word. We don't know these things that you established in your word. How can we say we are ignoring them when we don't even read your word? And we go into these churches with these pastors that are many times masons and just satanic plants that they're certainly not going to tell us. They want us to do Satanism. But Father, we're ignorant to your word, but let us be like the, the time where that young king rose up and read your word and he got rid of all the idolatry in Israel. Let us do that in our own lives, first of all, and let us walk away from the whore, the, the, the religious whore of a church that we've been a part of. Let us walk away and not partake of her sins anymore, Father. I'm asking you to open the eyes of your people and everyone listening especially and bless them to see how wicked all of this is, how wicked and evil all of this is and how just satanic it is, how awful it is, Father. Draw your people out of the muck and the mire and the filth, the stench, and I'm asking you, Father God, to deliver us and to take this wedding dress of ours that is, it's not white, it's haggard, it's ripped, it's torn, it's filthy with excrement, Lord. And I'm asking you to clean up this wedding dress by helping us to leave off of this satanic idolatry in these churches that we've been a part of for all these years, Lord, and help us to walk out of them and into your truth so that we may be made without spot or wrinkle, and holy without blemish, Lord. We want to do that for you and help us to have that desire 
and to seek after you, Father. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Jeff, you got anything to say in conclusion? Yeah, you know, I came away from Israel just feeling confused by my experience. And I think the reason why I felt so confused was I, I felt like there was this uneasy truce between all of these pagan religions and what amounts to a very volatile mixture. And it's volatile politically, it's volatile religiously, and it's volatile spiritually. And I think that's what I left with. And I think that's what we what we went through today. And I want to thank you for, for calling all this out. Oh, well, thank you. I so thank you for staying in contact with, with me uh, during your time there. And I know we'll have you on again. Sure appreciate it. Look forward to it. Thanks. All right. If you like the song you're hearing, you may download it for free at the Reverb Nation link below. If you want to see our blog spot, it's without spot or blemish.blogspot.com. And if you would like to donate, you can do so at the PayPal link below. Everything we do is free, even calls and ministry emails. We're not charging you for anything, but if you'd like to donate and help out, you can do so at the PayPal link below. Our handle there is withoutspot at gmail.com. You can also email us with your prayer requests and praise reports. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry.